disclaimer, I don't speak for any of the organizations on whose board I sit. I don't even speak for my law firm. Okay, I'm sorry, I, I probably should have mentioned that. Um, our last speaker will be Gil Kulik, who's the co-chair of the J Street New York Communications Media Committee. He's a founder of Ritzetica Shalom and a former communications director of the New Israel Fund and deputy political counselor at the U.S. Embassy in Israel. Thank you, Adam. Um, Kathleen has given you the reasons why we think that BDS will, cannot and will not achieve its objectives, whether those are to end the occupation or to end the state of Israel. Um, I'd like to give you uh, my thoughts on how it may be possible that there are possible solutions to this uh, using other means. There is a way to, a way to end the occupation. But first of all, I want to uh, make it clear, as Kathleen said, that uh, although I'm an active member of J Street, I'm not speaking for them tonight. Um, all the opinions and ideas that I may express are my own, although many of them are, of course, shared by J, J Street. But to the extent that I diverge from the gospel, it's uh, coming from me and not from them. Uh, I also want to emphasize emphatically what Kathleen said at the outset. I share very much the frustration of those of you who've turned to BDS out of despair over the lack of progress in ending the occupation of the Palestinian territories and the establishment of a Palestinian state alongside Israel. But I don't have much sympathy at all for those who advocate BDS as a means of eliminating Israel as a Jewish state. And as we've just heard, uh, that includes many of its most ardent proponents. Now, JP, JVP takes the position says that it takes no position on whether the outcome of the struggle should be two states or one state. But the reality is that anything other than a two-state solution means the disappearance of, this, of Israel as a Jewish state, which to me is totally unacceptable. And I appreciate Hannah's um, straightforwardness and her candor in acknowledging right from the outset that she does not believe in the legitimacy of a Jewish state. Uh, so we wonder why uh, people concerned that there's a campaign to delegitimize the state of Israel, you've heard exactly why people feel that way. But above all, whether your goal is two states or a single so-called secular democratic state, you don't hear that term too much these days, but that has been the objective of uh, those Palestinians who would like to see the state of Israel disappear. BDS will not get you there for all the reasons that Kathleen has so clearly articulated. If we don't bring an end to the occupation through a negotiated two-state agreement in the near future, we will end up with one state, but it won't be the state that many of you envision, because I'm certain that Israeli Jews and most American Jews will never give up Israel's Jewish identity in favor of a phantom secular democratic state, an imaginary one with an Arab majority, but with perfect equality for all of its citizens. Rather, if we fail to end the occupation, Israel will become an increasingly authoritarian state, dominated eventually by a Jewish minority, ruling over a largely disenfranchised Palestinian majority in the occupied territories. What you will have created is something resembling that apartheid state that many of Israel's opponents claim falsely, I believe, that Israel has already become. In other words, BDS can create a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm afraid things in Israel are already heading in that lamentable direction. We see many early signs of creeping what I call quasi-fascism, and I'm not the only one who calls it that, in the bills before the Knesset that would impose loyalty oaths, criminalize free speech, and restrict the rights of its Arab citizens. But efforts to demonize and delegitimize Israel through boycotts, investment, and sanctions will only accelerate that trend. What they will not do is induce Israelis to re-examine and reject the disastrous anti-democratic policies that Netanyahu and his government are pursuing. On the contrary, they will confirm the, they will confirm the conviction that, quote, the whole world is against us, and the patriotic Israelis must rally around their hardline government, whatever misgivings they may have about that. So what then is the answer, or is there any answer at all? Kathleen has cogently given the many reasons we are convinced that BDS will not produce an outcome that its proponents pursue, whether that's to end the occupation or, perniciously in my view, to bring about the collapse of the Zionist enterprise. We believe, Dafka, that they will only make the current intolerable situation worse. 
What, if anything, then has a chance of bringing about the just and lasting peace that I, th I think we all sincerely seek, even if we have very different visions of what that means? I believe that the only thing that has a chance of turning Israel around from its self-destructive course is a tremendous shift in public opinion, both in Israel and the United States. Something dramatic needs to be done to persuade Israelis and American Jews, as well as Palestinians, that there is a formula that can bring about a negotiated end to the occupation, which a great majority of Israelis actually do support, uh, leading to two states for two peoples while meeting Israel's fundamental and legitimate security concerns. And believe me, they are not made up, those concerns. We know there is such a formula because its terms have been elaborated at least twice, first in the Geneva Accords and the ILON Museva Initiative, and if you don't know what those are, I'll be happy to explain them later on. But these were two model agreements arrived at by high-level and highly respected leaders, both among the Palestinians and the Israelis, that met all of the basic requirements of both sides. They were able to agree uh, on a set of propositions that would have that would settle the conflict. Those terms were also laid out in the so-called Clinton parameters, which the United States belatedly and privately put forth after the failure of Camp David in 2000 and after the second intifada had begun. And Abu Mazen, and Prime Minister Abu Mazen is the president of the Palestinian Authority, and Prime Minister Ehud Olmert came painfully close to reaching an agreement along those lines just before the current right-wing government unfortunately came to power. <coughs> But these formulas have failed to gain traction with most Israelis because they haven't been confronted with any hard choices. Efforts to cajole or bribe Netanyahu into freezing settlements have failed because the U.S. has been unwilling forever, for whatever reasons to impose any penalties for his refusal. So far, it's been all carrots and no sticks. So the Israeli public has acquiesced just because they felt no urgency to seriously question or challenge continuing settlement building and other policies. Now the Palestinians, in my view, may have come further toward compromise on the core issues, but they too are holding out, at least publicly, on hardcore issues like the right of return, which I don't, which I don't doubt they know, BDS movement to the contrary, notwithstanding that they will have to relinquish in a final status agreement in all but symbolic form of a uh, nominal repatriation and family reunification within Israel. <coughs> the right of return will have to be exercised within the Palestinian state. And as I say, say, I think everyone understands that, even though at this point no one is going to be willing to concede that. If there is to be any chance for ending this stalemate and ultimately the occupation, all of that has to change and change very soon. The time has come for the United States, the only party that still has the basic trust of both sides, to audaciously confront both parties and the Israeli Palestinian public with hard choices. I believe the President of the United States, this is my, this is the Kulik plan. <laughs> I believe that the President of the United States, in a speech to the Knesset, should publicly put on the table the terms of an agreement along the lines of the Clinton parameters that majorities of the people on both sides, as well as in the United States, could see as a fair and equal set of compromises that meets each side's most fundamental requirements. Having laid out this vision, on which, as I said, there's already a large degree of consensus, the U.S. should challenge both sides to, to embrace it or be seen by their own publics and the rest of the world as the recalcitrant party striding, standing in the way of a peaceful resolution of the conflict. I could by, be naive, but my guess is that the PLO under Abu Mazen is likely to be more amenable to such proposals than a Likud government headed by Netanyahu. Uh, but there must be consequences for whoever is seen as rejecting a reasonable compromise and standing in the way of peace. The U.S. must make it clear that there will be no more business as usual with Israel, or for that matter, with the Palestinians, if they continue to block the road to peace once these proposals are publicly presented. This, of course, could be a very tricky business. The President would have to tread a very thin line between tepid rhetorical responses like calling the announcement of 1,300 new housing, housing units in Jerusalem unhelpful, um, and blunt instruments like threatening to withhold military aid, which would provoke fear and defiance um, like that aroused by BDS. But I'm convinced that it can be done. If that needle be can be threaded, 
or at least I firmly hope that the Israeli electorate, which until now has allowed itself to be convinced that there is no partnership for peace, no partner for peace, would grasp this unprecedented opportunity and begin to turn away from the right-wing obduracy standing in its way. And I expect that a majority of American Jews would stand with our government in its daring effort to sever this most Gordian of knots. I'm coming to the conclusion. But of one thing I'm fairly sure, an Israeli and Israel feeling isolated and threatened by boycotts and divestments would be much less likely to take those risks for peace than an Israel that felt in its legitimate place in the family of nations was secure. Of course, there's no guarantee that such a point would work or that it even would be undertaken. Um, it's, un it's not unimaginable that the Palestinians could prove equally recalcitrant or that the Israeli public has moved so irrede irredeemably to the right that they would reject even as exquisitely fair and balanced a set of principles. Uh, or that the conventional pro-Israel lobby and the Republican controlled Congress could generate so much opposition in the U.S. that the president would feel constrained to back down once again. Under such circumstances, the role of pro-Israel, pro-organization, pro-peace organizations like J Street, and indeed every person who's committed to peace for Israel and justice for the Palestinians, could be critical in giving the president uh, the backing and the backbone he would need to stand his ground. We must speak out publicly and vociferously in support of the president, flood Congress and the media with calls and letters, and give generously to groups working to mobilize public support in the Jewish community and beyond. Thank you.